Hi. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming by and spending time with us this uh, afternoon uh, at the launch of our latest collection of poetry by Yong Shu Hung. Shu Hung is well known as a poet. He has uh, many collections of poetry, and this is his uh, latest uh, uh, collection. I will leave him to tell you a little bit more about it in the context in which he, why he uh, put it in the sequence that he did and how it's done. Yeah? Uh, Shu Hong, please. Thank you. Hi, um, thanks for coming. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank um, Ho Fang and Wai Han, who is out there somewhere looking for missing books. And I was telling Ho Fang that um, nobody would steal poetry books, right? Yeah. What is still fresh in my mind is this whole process of um, getting the book into print. So you can see that um, the choice of the fonts, the usage of this dragonfly wings, how the, the tip of the wing should be cut off a little bit so that it doesn't look too phallic. Then there's the significance of the red and the blue, which some of you all might be able to guess what it is. And then the blurred outline that sort of wrapped towards the, the back of it. And I'm describing all this in graphic detail partly to help um, Ethos to sell the books and recover the costs and also to give you an idea of the, the evolution of the book. I, I think I've explained this to some people but I don't know whether anyone understands the significance of the, the red and blue. Yeah, the 3D glasses because the old 3D glasses has got the, the, red, the red on one side and the blue on one side but now you, you can't see it because the, the new 3D glasses, is, they're, they're basically transparent, right? I mean, you, you, you don't see the, uh, the bluish or the, the reddish tint. So the whole idea is to use the dragonfly wings um, and, and have a bit of that indication of the viewing part. The Viewing Party is the title of the book. Um, I think I came about this, this title quite earlier, much earlier on, when I was thinking of... Um, I can't remember whether I actually read this particular term from a magazine or maybe there was something called the listening party that was mentioned in the magazine where you just go into this room and listen to the latest album by a band even though the band is not there somebody will play the CD and then you just sit around and listen um, so the viewing party is sort of like a media preview screenings that I used to attend quite a bit um, there's obviously the other meanings that's associated with that like the third party or the observer, the voyeur, the onlooker, the spectator, whoever is doing the viewing. So I thought that um, to start off this book with a series of poems about my grandfather is quite apt because it was written about the wake, the funeral wake of my, my, my grandfather when he passed on. And in a way, you know, the whole idea of the open coffin, um, someone being put up on display, and of course the mourners coming and, and they are the viewers who, who's coming to pay their last respects uh, I thought that that might be quite interesting uh, I, I tell people that this book is basically about death and cinema so death is sort of covered in, in that series and I'll just read one poem from that series that's called Dragonflies when my grandmother passed away there was, there was a butterfly that was hovering a, above the coffin and you know, Chinese people, they like to attach symbolisms to, to everything. So they'll say that, oh, um, that's the reincarnation of, of grandma because she likes flowers. And, and so when my grandparents, uh, when my granddad passed away, uh, this, there, there actually were quite a number of dragonflies hovering around. So I think dragonfly is, is kind of a more masculine kind of a symbol. So this series of poems is, is called Dragonflies. And I'm reading part, part three. Uh, it's broken up into nine parts, uh, sort of like one part for every decade that my grandfather has lived. Part 3. Uncle claims that grandfather had turned over a new leaf just prior to his death and given up smoking. So there's no need to toss cigarettes into the coffin, even though there are packs remaining. No, the dead do not need temptation for company. Perhaps just a new pair of glasses to keep the scenery in focus. Still, it's funny how I had learned one day about the evils of smoking in school. 
then thought of persuading grandfather to quit, except that no words came, and I turned and left his room, lived with the guilt for years, till I forgot, but still remember that his Dunhill boxes are maroon and blazoned with gold. So basically this book started off as a collection of fragments of writing that are exactly a hundred words each. And uh, Jen Crawford, who is my colleague at NTU, uh, the Nanyang Technological University, where I'm doing my writing residency now, uh, she was asking me, what is this name for this particular form, whereby the text is presented in a hundred words exactly? So at that point in time, I didn't know. Then later on, Sam Min, who's sitting right there, told me that, oh, there is a term for it, and it's called Drabble. And I was a little bit disappointed because Drabble sounds so lame as a, as a name, right? Sounds like um, saliva that is flowing out of a corner of your lips or something, or, or you, you're dabbling in, in some kind of very inconsequential type of writing. Um, but in any case, um, I should probably read this particular first piece of Drabble that's called um, The Mercy Seeds. Uh, the Mercy Seeds. After mother died from illness one Christmas, he lost all interest in Christmas itself. As a doctor, he sometimes feels like Santa Claus, for giving people second chances at life. But he also aids their dying. When the pain gets too much to bear, now that's a different gift. This Christmas morning, he is walking towards his first patient with the little dosage of two pills, the shape of poppy seeds. But he can't help thinking about how his mother's eyelids had quivered as she drew her last breath, as if she had just caught the first glimpse of paradise. And it started off with a series of poems about my grandfather. There's a section of hundred worded pieces. Um, and then there's the, the abandoned works, um, the short story, The Great Dying, another section of a hundred worded pieces. And the last part that will sort of round up this whole, whole, whole book is what I call the, the normal poems, right? Um, the poems that comes in different shapes, different formats, different lengths. Um, and it closes the entire book with this section called Searching to Get Lost, uh, which sounded a little bit open-ended. open, open -ended. So it's not like death is, is, is driving that final nail into the coffin. So I think I'll stop here and invite you guys to ask questions. Shuho, can I ask? Yes. Uh, when you decided to engage in this travel, did you find that it uh, limited your creativity and your writing, uh, the, the way you express yourself, or did it help in uh, mm. you know, tightening it? I, I think restrictions seem to set me free somehow, I don't know why. Like when Simin, um, Kai Chai and Seok and I went on this trip um, across Scandinavia, um, the, the idea of using the last line of somebody's poem to be the first line of my poem in the sort of exquisite corpse kind of a, a pattern, it, it really frees up the imagination, it really frees up the imagination in some ways. And I kind of think of those, those set of poems as, as being quite, quite definitive of, of the kind of poetry that I, I wish I could continue to write. Um, I think I'll just end off by just reading one more poem. And this one is a little bit of um, a little bit about memories as well, uh, about being nostalgic for the past. And you know that in the in the past there were a lot of cinemas that that that's that's been demolished or repurposed for other kinds of usage. And um, there's a reference to this cinema called Kokhua. Nothing to do with our NAC. Um, Director, um, where's Kok Hua? Kok Hua is not here. Yeah, just now he was um, at the back. 
So this is not a love poem to Kokwa, but uh, it's about a cinema that was in Aogang, Upper Serangoon Road somewhere. And that was the cinema that I, I watched the first film by myself. So it's a bit of that, that coming of age. So this is called Roll Call of the Fallen. There were cinemas that I was too young to recall and those that I was too old to forget or not know. Like Lido as a standalone hall before the invasion of multiplexes, when one visited a designated cinema to catch a particular show, which, if popular, might run over three months before last days was announced. I even remember how cats were plying the owls as the towering inferno devoured the entire white screen, or buying advance tickets for Alien at the Odeon, being shaken by Jaws at Prince, or watching Capricorn One at Premier, now a nightclub in the Orchard Towers. On a Wikipedia page, I discovered the names of closed cinemas in Singapore, towed up like Mausoleum Nietzsche's Cyros, Dalit, Hoover, Kokhua, where I came of age viewing the first film on my own, Roxy, Zenith, a roll call wound within a film spool I cannot let slip. Thanks a lot for your attention. Uh, thanks again to um, Ho Fang and Wai Han, um, kind folks behind Ethos Books for, for publishing this. So please support them. Thank you. Uh...